I'm going to start with building a cult first, um, because this can apply for DJs, promoters. Um, reason I got really interested in this stuff was I accidentally joined a cult once, and I was like, how the fuck did that happen? Um, it's, like, it's super annoying. It's like hell hard to get out of. And <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? I was like, how did that happen? And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I, at the time I was like working, like promoting events, I was like, huh, let's see if we can use these powers for good? Depends. What cult was it? I want to say, because like, <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, like sometimes, um, oh fuck it, this room's small. It's um, but like every now and then I, I talk to someone and they're like in it and I'm like, oh man, god damn it. Cool. Um, so anyway, let's talk about building one. They um, almost got me once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to build a cult-like following, um, pretty consistent across whether it's religion, politics, they all really follow, they all have three main things. And they just have a vision for the future, which is a towards motivator. They have an enemy, which I mentioned before, which is an away from motivator. And they also have, this is Rich coming from me, but a charismatic leader. Someone that's really good at speaking as well. And so that's the promoter, you guys. Um, with the towards and away from motivators, it's really important to have both of those. Um, interesting fact, if you get a mouse and you tie a little string to it and you tie it to a spring that will measure how hard it's pulling. If you waft in a smell of cheese at the front, a towards motivator, it will tug and you can measure the strength at which it pulls on that spring. But if you waft in the smell of a cat behind it, it will pull harder. And so away from motivators are actually considerably stronger than towards motivators. <clears throat> so a vision for the future, this is really essentially your unique selling point. Now, whenever I talk about unique selling point, people always wonder what that is. Um, it could be any number of things. It could just be that you're the first event to pop up in a new kind of music trend. It could be um, the event space. Like, Quincy's doing that really well, like side quests, where he fucking asked me to do a party in my office. I was like, fuck no, bro, I'm gonna get kicked out. So he's doing all these like really interesting little venues and pop-ups where it changes the experience. That gives him an advantage over nightclubs where the experience and the venue stays precisely the same. You can paint it with balloons and all this shit and Halloween stuff. Same fucking building, bro, right? And so that's his unique selling point. <clears throat> so that's your vision for the future. It doesn't necessarily need to be related to the event. It can be related to the culture as well. So I had not a phase, which was like an emo night, which was just this little, we operated out of uh, the little fucking storage room, Metro's Frio, and people would come and wear eyeliner and skinny ripped jeans and have a great time and sing My Chemical Romance, and sometimes they cried a lot of spit. Really great time. And so sometimes that's their big motivator as well, which pulls really well towards an enemy. So for not a phase, the enemy was just like kids that picked us on us in high school and they're not here. Isn't that sick? <laughs> right? Enemy could be another venue. I Fuck it, he's not going to send me another cease and desist. I did this really well with bar one. That dude fucking hates me, right? So, <laughs> like, really badly. You can pick another venue. You can pick another side of the river. So I did, I did, I did the socials for arcade nightclubs north of the river. Metro's for south of the river. I was posting on arcade's page saying, fuck south of the river. I was posting on Metro's page saying, north of the river or fucking dogs. And I was living in East Perth, two blocks that way. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you can just pick, you can pick another style of music. Drum and bass doesn't like house. House, drum and bass is too fast. Right? I get that comment sometimes. Other side of the river, or you can just fucking make one up. Right? Interesting ways you can do that. I do this in like ads for where you, um, I don't know if you guys will get targeted by those ads if you're just in there nodding. Um, yeah, it's a good luck. It's really fucking cheap for me to advertise there. Um, I'll make up like a boogeyman, which will be just like, I don't know, other people that like sell online courses. Just other people. You don't want to be like those people. Or people that will like put a payment gateway on the second page. I don't know, maybe they are. Fucking, but now they're thinking about this thing that could be a thing and I'm not one of them, right? Just make up an enemy. Charismatic leader. So you need to be able to communicate your vision for the future. This is really important. This, this, sorry, this makes it really important to have an event that you're genuinely excited about. 
I'm going to talk about the benefits of, or the, the lack of benefit in financial motivation. But unless you're genuinely intrinsically, not extrinsically motivated by your event, it's very hard for you to be a charismatic leader and communicate how excited you are about it. People can read through it, right? If you're just like, I'm just going to do this event and we're going to play music and some people are going to come and we're going to pay them 10 bucks, charge them 10 bucks, we're going to make some money. Not very exciting. But if you're like, bro, we're going to do, like, get this right. We're going to do this pop-up email event in a fucking storage room. Roby's going to do And you can communicate that, that excitement for that vision. That's when, and I'm going to get to it, you can attract more promoter talent. And you can squeeze more out of them because they're just as fucking excited as you are. Finance is actually not that strong a motivator. But visions for the future are. That's why people will die for religions. Right? No one's dying for their manager. You need to publicly scold the enemy as well. That's really powerful. <laughs> don't get a cease and desist. Um, don't buy their club's name as a domain name um, and redirect it to your club's Facebook page. <laughs> but you want to be able to publicly scold the enemy and, and point them out. Now, to build real rapport, and what I mean by that is when you're communicating with like either pat because patrons need to see that you're excited about this event as well. When you're communicating with them, there's only two fucking things you actually really have to do. And this is getting a little bit more tactical because this is just like on the night kind of stuff. All you need to do is just ask about the other person a lot and mirror them. That's it. So what that is is when they're arriving, you just ask them how the day was. You don't talk about, hey, we're so fucking busy tonight, come in. Because it's all about you. That book, what's it called? I read it fucking five years ago when I was getting into personal development. How to win friends and influence people, all that stuff. You just talk about the other person. You know why? Because they know all the answers. <laughs> right? People, everyone's favorite topic. That's why people like going on podcasts. They get asked about themselves and they know all the answers. It's fantastic. I can't be wrong. It's great. <laughs> Mirroring. You can do this physically and... <laughs> I hate that I'm a minute. The reason I got into this stuff as well was, I was like, how old was I? I think I was like 18 or not. I think I was like 19. I was like, all right, you don't know how to talk to girls. You got to figure that out because you, you can't keep doing it this way. And then I started learning all this stuff. So the other one is like mirroring, which is you can do that either verbally or like physically. And it works with guys and girls, doesn't matter. Um, so verbally would be like, Jackson, can you say something to me? Just, just say a sentence. No, I mean like an actual sentence, bro. Oh, an actual sentence. Just, just tell me how your day was. My day was great. Your day was great? Literally just repeat. You didn't fucking really give me a good one. <laughs> but if they got a longer sentence, you just repeat the last two or three words with an upwards inflection, and then they just elaborate more. You do it in sales too, right? And so that's, that's vocal mirroring. And then, it just gets, and then that's when people say like, man, you just feel like such a good listener. Or well, I feel like I can talk to you. And all you're doing is just repeating the last three words with an upwards inflection. That's all it is. It's really weird and subconscious. You can do it physically as well. Um, so, for example, like if I was to try and mirror Nick, it would literally be just sitting like that. It's really weird. Like, I'll watch my sales guys' recordings on Zoom. There's a very good reason we do it on Zoom. It's because you can mirror them on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> like, if I have a sales guy that's sitting there like this, and the, the prospect is kind of just like slumped like this. Dude's not closing, the, not, not closing the deal. There's not enough rapport. Because this guy's, up, this guy's energy levels are down here. My sales guy's energy is up here. And this, now there's just this weird subconscious gap and this guy doesn't trust this guy. And it's too far apart. And what you need to be able to do is if you imagine like two thermometers, it's essentially the same as fucking sales. Um, if you imagine like two thermometers, you have one which is like buyer's resistance, which is red hot as soon as they come into the call or as soon as they meet you, which is just like, they know you're a salesperson, right? And people don't like being sold to. And then you have another thermometer, which is sales acceptance or buyer's acceptance. It's ice cold. They're not buying shit. You need to reduce buyer's resistance before you can have permission to increase buyer's acceptance. It's the same with building rapport. If you come in with like way too much energy and the person's coming down, that person doesn't trust you. It's just a subconscious thing where people like being with people that are like them. <clears throat> Managing your disciples, promoters. I'm going to give you some high-level stuff and then some tactical stuff as well. And at the end, I'm going to do some Q&A because I know you guys had some stuff about what are the first steps to like launch the event, things like that. Cool. Um, 
The functional and necessary way is to track through some kind of financial incentive. That could be any number of things like a discount code where they get five bucks. It could be the guest list thing, um, whatever, right? The main reason you need that is you actually just need a way to track who's good and who's not. And it kind of gives them something. It's actually not the thing that's going to motivate them though. The elite way is you do attraction through vision, which we've already covered. You do performance through transparency, which is everyone knows how well everyone's doing regularly. And you get retention through community. The average, like the churn rate on promoters, churn rate on sales people's fucking high. Churn rate on promoters even worse because they're not actually making fucking like good money at all, right? I had promoters that lasted half a decade with me. Usually promoters last a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. I promoters last my entire career at Arcade, right? And usually when they get older, they, they drop off, not these ones, <laughs> right? And it's because we had that really strong community there. <clears throat> cool, so attraction through vision. We've already worked that out in the previous section. So for example, when I launched Not A Phase, I got all of my friends that were like excited. I just messaging people because I was just off, buzzing off the walls. I was like, do you want to come? And we're, we're going to plan everything. I just brought everyone to my house and talked about how excited I was. And then everyone else got excited about it. You know, the buyer's acceptance thing went up. And then everyone else was spitting out their ideas. And now it wasn't just my event, it was our event. That was really important because now they feel like they have a sense of ownership. It isn't Brandon telling me to do this thing and so I'm listening to him. Brandon had this idea, he liked my idea, now it's our idea and we're doing it together. That's so much more powerful than just telling someone what to do. Hey, post this on Facebook, put this on your story. Blah, 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 follow my orders, right? People don't like that. Some other more tactical notes. Um, hire more than you need because a bunch will drop off quickly just through underperformance or just like saying they're interested and then just not doing anything, right? General rule of thumb, hire three more than you need. Cool. What is lack of excitement? Systemize for volume. So usually what you do is you'll get the inquiry. What I say is, hey, I'm going to copy and paste a really long message because I just send it to a lot of people. So just like apologies for the obviously copy and paste the message. Let me know when you get through this. Copy and paste the message. It's saved into your notes. Let me know when you get through all of that and if you've got any questions. And then start doing stuff. Right. <clears throat> this one's really, really big. Usually the unpopular looking ones will surprise you. Because usually you'll get their like Instagram follower account and like how many friends they have and how many likes on their profile picture. The unpopular ones more often than not outperformed the popular looking ones. I'm not, sh I can't say for sure. I don't know how right it is in me saying this, but I think it's because they have something to prove. They, they, they want to, they weren't the popular kid. And, and now they have this like, kind of desire to prove that they are. Whereas the popular ones, they already got their validation. They actually, they're fucking really lazy usually as well. There's a couple outliers. Everyone's sitting on a normally distributed bell curve, so you got some outliers in some aspects. But usually the popular ones didn't do that well. <clears throat> Performance through transparency. So everyone should know regularly how they're performing against everyone else. I still, I could probably find it on my, I'm not this laptop, I had to change my laptop this morning, but um, I had a running Google sheet from my first week as, a, as promotions manager at Arcade to my last week. Of every single week, every single promoter we had, how many names they submitted, how many were ticked off, their attendance rates, all this stuff. Stats for everything, because I, I like Google Sheets. When performance went the best. There was, there was two inflections. One was when I gave them better incentives than as the bar cards. The main one, I didn't even add any incentives. All I did was I exported everything into a graph. I had everyone's names and a bar graph that said how many they brought last month. Exported as a PNG, put it in the group chat, didn't say anything. And now everyone could see where they were. And maybe this is another girl they don't like in the group and they're doing better than them. But what they had now is transparency and they knew where they stacked up. They knew if they were outperforming, they knew if they were at the bottom, they knew if they were just doing average. And then what that also meant as well is if when you get to those tough conversations, because you're going to fire a lot pretty quickly, writing's on the wall. It's on the, oh, I was doing my best. It's like, this is a results driven thing. You've seen the graph for the last three months. Like, this, this is a given, right? This, one's, <laughs> this one kind of sucks, but it's true. If a star performer gets into a relationship, the performance is usually going to drop. Just wait. <laughs> They're like 19. It's not, probably not going to get married, right? So just wait. I had some star performers and then give it, like, give it a couple of months. There'll be 
heartbroken and stuff, and then they'll come back, and then they'll probably outperform because now they're trying to impress people. Retention for a community. Man, the number of times I had to give like the dad talk to like you know girls that just had like their heart broken. Blah, blah, blah. But, like was, when he eventually I just got called dad because I was like 25 trying to babysit all these kids at nightclubs <laughs> and stuff. It gets weird. Group chats, the obvious one. Um, promoter only events, they want to feel like they're exclusive. You usually make them like bring one or two of their other friends and then those friends feel like they're part of like some inside kind of circle. I already mentioned this, but involve them in the event planning and brain brainstorming process because they're probably, probably spent, well, they are, probably spending more time with patrons than you are because you're hanging out on stage in the green room and you're antisocial. I know it. I am too. <laughs> so they get feedback and hear ideas. And they'll have a sense of ownership, like I said, for any ideas you implement, and they'll push harder to see it succeed. So if you take someone's idea and like, hey, Jackson, great idea, let's run it this week or next week or next month, fucking imagine how hard that dude's pushing to make sure it works so you do his next idea, right? They've got that sense of ownership. It's not just Brandon's idea, it's our idea. Well, really, it's their idea. <clears throat> I'm trying to think if there's any other points. Points here, because this community thing was like really, really important. There was, um, it was a fucking nightmare, but it was really important I did it early in my career, was I figured out the night when most of the promoters were there, and then I, it's fucking hard. You know when you're trying to find out when one friend is in the club and you're all drunk? Imagine trying to get two dozen of you to meet up at the same time. It was fucking impossible, but I managed to pull it off. It was really important, but all the promoters met each other and started knowing each other. And so they started meeting each other's friend groups and stuff like that. Really, really important, but it's hard to pull off because everyone's drunk. Cool. How'd it go? Last question for that one. Yeah, of course. What was like the spread of people that you were finding? Was, was it like majority DJs wanting to do gigs? Was for it, promoters? Yeah, like was it, was it like, because I'm struggling to see like the incentive side of thing, right? Like, yeah, I yeah. I imagine it's a majority 18 to 21 year olds who are clubbing for the first time and yep. they just want to be a part of it. Yeah, it's usually that and they're broken, you've got a bar card. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. like, honest, honestly, it's like that. It's, it's yeah. literally just, like, hiring a bunch mm. and then figuring out which ones work. That's yeah. honestly what it is. Usually it's just, like, posting on your socials and things like that and saying, hey, do you want to be part of this team? And you have, like, team photos and stuff like that. Here's all the perks of working with us. If you're interested, send us a DM. And then just trying a bunch of them. Hiring really, like, pretty quickly, but firing, honestly, pretty quickly as well. And it's really, really high churn, so you got to do it pretty consistently. It's super, it was the most laborious fucking thing. One of the biggest incentives was just like, hey, they're getting free entry and discounts on drinks, because they're planning on going out anyway. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. And then the way you get them to like really well perform or like really get excited about it is the vision thing. Yeah. How to go so viral, your Pfizer search spikes. Cool. Common misconception. Um, I've had a couple of things go viral. Um, and I, at the start, I was like, what the fuck, why did that go viral? And then it becomes really interesting. And then we kind of studied like a bunch of it. Really common misconception is people think that usually like humor alone is enough to go viral. It helps, it's not it though. Because there's, like think about it, there's countless things that are funny, that are funny videos that don't go viral, and it's because they miss one thing. Like imagine out of all of the stand-up comedy bits, this is an easy example, out of all the stand-up comedy bits, the bits that always go viral, it's because they contain relatability, right? It could be geography. Quincy did this really well with like his original Don Darko things where he would like zoom into Perth, you're like, I live in Perth. <laughs> really fucking simple. <laughs> or like, I was telling him to do like, just like backgrounds like, you know, the fucking cactus stupid looking thing. Right? If you catch something where it's just like, oh, I'm from here, well, I want to go there, it's like, oh, maybe I'm in it, or something like that. So geography is a really easy one. Situations is the given one, so there's, that's the standard, that feeling when, uh, or when, uh, happens, right? Relatable situations. Nostalgia, like my mixtape thing, everyone, it wasn't even that good, it was just like relatable, because like, ah, oh, the Wii music, I played Wii. <coughs> Current events, uh, whatever's trending in the news, I was on a, um, podcast yesterday, so I'm going to steal this from Sev. Hi, Sev. Um, I actually don't think it recorded either, so this podcast might not ever come out. Um, but he explained his um, formula for going viral for like trending events. So usually what you do is you need to plan in advance, like what's going to be on the news soon? Like is Apple releasing a new product soon? Is this album coming out soon? Is there a sports thing happening soon? 
and then you make the content about that first so that when people start searching for it, you're already kind of first in line. So trending events. That was like, how fast was it until you saw like the first Will Smith slap remix fucking thing, right? Like eight and a half minutes flat and it was a remix, <laughs> right? Are there any events you like to stay away from because trending? Like, a like, war. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, like that or like, no. you don't, I mean, depends how cancelable, I own cancelwilco.com so you can't touch me, <laughs> um, but, maybe you can try, but, um, yeah, it literally, the, the, the real answer is, it just depends on your brand, how far you want to push it, the general rule of thumb is just like, like anything, you don't go like homophobic or um, like racist or anything like that, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. It just depends on the brand, like where you want to go with it. How, um, I mean, 2023 it gets it gets dangerous, bro. Um, are there any questions about this slide? By the way, I probably should have said at the start. Um, you guys don't need to raise your hand. Just shout out questions. We can talk. You guys are grown ups. Um, so yeah, if, if if you just have like a comment or you have a question, just shout out. Yeah. When you were talking about promoters. Yeah, so perhaps I should have given a definition there. So promoters is anyone that's just obviously promoting your event. So your team that maybe they're giving, they're doing guest lists or they have discount codes or things like that. Okay. Cool. Cool. Sorry, yeah, not promoters isn't like, yeah. you guys are promoters, but like I mean like the team. <laughs> cool. Um, I don't have a slide for this one because this could go in any number of fucking different directions. Um, the best starting question is, do you guys ever feel like maybe you're working on track structure, you can probably chime in a little bit here as well, um, and you get stuck and you kind of like grind to a halt and you don't know what's next and maybe you're on like a four bar loop or the, the converse of that is have you ever been in like a flow state where like you just knew what the next track was and you knew the next step to do and you didn't need to think about it and you've, everything felt really fluid. Has anyone ever experienced that? Yeah. Cool. Um, so I work, I really wish I had a whiteboard. <coughs> I work with this flow coach that um, taught me this model. Um, it's really, really useful. Um, so if you have a U shape like this, at the top, sorry, Coop, I'll show you. You have flow, which is like optimal performance. On the right, you have like distressed. And then maybe like um, anxious is over here. Um, and then maybe um, worried is here. And usually the way we, we draw it is we have like blue here and then it gets redder and redder here, right? So this is like a red lining car, okay? Um, down here is like relaxed. Here is like engaged. And here is playful. What you can actually do is once you familiarize yourself with this model, you can immediately course correct yourself. So I started working with this guy because I had that boxing fight and I got bashed like a week, week in a, no, two weeks ago now. Um, and I, I was just curious because I was like, okay, well, I, I want to know how the mind works and I'm scared. And he, he walked me through this whole model where he got me to go, okay, we mapped it all out on a whiteboard. He goes, what happens when you're in the fight? Like I go, oh, I, I, I freeze up and I'm, I'm worried about losing, outcome orientated. Right? I'm too attached to the outcome. He goes, what happens to, I freeze, which is like, I don't know the next step. Whereas flow is like, you're not even worried about the outcome. You're just going, going through the motions and things like that. So he taught me this model that if I'm feeling anxious, 
what you actually do is wherever you are on this side, you re-correct to the opposite side. <laughs> I'll send it to you after. <laughs> um, so if you're distressed, you need to go to relaxed. So if you, you can't sleep at night and you're worried and things like that, take a holiday, right? If you're feeling worried, you need to correct to engage, which is just like, you're not completely relaxed, but you're just kind of taking a step back and you're playing with it. This was the one that helped me the most though, and I think this is gonna land with a lot of you guys as well. If I was feeling anxious, I just needed to go to playful. So in the context of the boxing fight, if I was feeling anxious, I would actually just start talking shit to the other guy, because that was my way of being playful. Or like I'd try and bounce off the ropes and like fucking punch him and do dumb moves and WWE moves and stuff like that, right? Like have you guys ever been, like pretty much the thing that happens right before flow state is you feel playful, right? Like you feel in the moment when you're playing, like this will be a funny song to play next and you just make it work and things like that. So this is an interesting model that you guys can use to find flow. And the thing that happens right before flow as well is there's a little bit where you need to kind of break through. I did the flow research collective course. Um, I'll send you guys some of the slides. I probably shouldn't. But um, there's a struggle phase and then there's a release phase. And so the struggle phase, all of the neurochemicals that are happening, they're all kind of building up and then the release, you kind of just like slip into flow. It's kind of like when you're paddling out on a surfboard and then you're grinding and you're paddling and then suddenly you just, you just drop into the wave. Some other um, useful things you guys can do is, is resets. So um, this is like a one hour lecture this dude gave me when we went for a walk and I'm gonna try and condense it into two minutes. Um, neuroscientists would argue that the brain essentially has like two brains. There's the thinking brain and the being brain. The thinking brain actually just takes up less space in the brains around the front um, and it develops more recently. But also because it developed more recently, it gets triggered more easily. So because, you know, things are easy or like Uber Eats was late, now we're triggered and shit like that, right? <coughs> the being brain is just the OG. It's been there the whole time. The thinking brain can only for process, I think I'm hopefully getting these stats right. I'm, I'm definitely gonna get the variance right, but the exact figure might be off. I think it's like 4,000 bits of information per second. Does so anyone want to take a guess how many bits of information the being brain can do in a second? It's like 40 billion, right? And so what usually happens is when you guys are struggling and anxious, you go into the thinking brain, you try and think your way out of it, but then you lock yourself into a CPU that can only process 4,000 bits of information per second. But if you can get yourself, and I'll show you guys some, like, um, some resets, reset yourself out of it, you can unlock 40 billion bits of information per second. And that's when you can slip into flow really, really easily. Some things you guys can do is um, they need to be resets that are physical where the physical action, like it's all you can think about. Easiest one is you can just pinch yourself really, 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 really fucking hard. Some other things is just like physical walks and things like that. Me and the sales guys, we do it. We, go upstairs to the, like the apartment we're attached to and we play paddleboard. All we can talk, all we can think and feel is paddleboard. We're not just thinking about the sale that we just lost or anything like that so we can reset for the next sale. Um, float tanks are a great one. I do those as well. And what you can do is you can kind of schedule them, right? So you can do them throughout the day, like during lunch and things like that, just to reset yourself if you're feeling stressed. But you can do them weekly, monthly, quarterly, all those kinds of things. Time. This, this popped up a couple times for a few of you guys. Um, who, who said time was, a, you said that was time? You said time, did you say time was an issue for you? Who else said time was an issue? There's a couple other people. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you guys using calendars? You are? Are you using a calendar? Like a, like a, are you using like a Google calendar or anything like that? No, I'm not. Cool, let's do that first. Because usually what happens, I do this exercise a lot with people um, and I'm like mentoring them and things like that is, is anyone here particularly religious? Because hopefully this doesn't offend you, but like your calendar is gonna become your Bible, right? If it is in there, it will get done. I have this running joke with my friends that like, um, if my sleep block wasn't my calendar, I'd be sitting at home at midnight saying, I swear I had something to do. Um, 
it becomes really, really important. And it also gives you a visual map of how much time you actually have. Um, <coughs> yeah, let me actually, oh, I don't have Wi-Fi, but usually what I'll do is when someone doesn't use a calendar, I'll just walk them through these steps. I think, you, I think you've done this from my YouTube video, actually. Um, I'll go, cool, just, just use Google Calendar. It's, just, it's free, and you can make recurring calendar events and things like that, weekly or monthly or custom. You start with a blank calendar because you're not using one, so it's good. Um, just start with sleep first. Just block out sleep. That's going to whittle you down to less white space. And then work, which is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or whatever your hours are, you study. Just do all your non-negotiables. Sleep and making money are non-negotiables, so let's do those first. Then do your meals, 30 minutes. And then do any commuting, travel, right? So now we've completely eliminated the sleep, the work, the I have to eat, um, and I've got to drive places. Now you have white space left. People are usually surprised with how much time they actually fucking have. It's really, really common. They're like, I don't have time. Maybe, but show me. Um, so do that first. Um, this links really well with the, with the flow thing because usually what will happen is you'll get from work um, and then you got home from work and so you feel like that and then you can't, it's too much of a grind to um, get into the next thing you have to do. That means you have to do a reset. Go for a walk or just meditate for like 10 minutes. Doesn't need to be guided or anything like that. You just had to sit there in 10 minutes and just focus on breathing in and out and then focus on the little sensation at the tip of your little mustache of the air going in and out and you're just focusing on that for 10 minutes. And that will reset you and you'd be really, 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 really surprised at how much your energy levels can spike just from doing that. Because usually what happens is you guys get from work, get home from work and you slump into your couch and then you doom scroll TikTok. That is a terrible form of recovery. <laughs> it's awful. There's a couple of things like I learned in the Flow Research Collective, which things that are, you guys think are recovery, but maybe not you guys, but people think is recovery, but it's not. Doom scrolling TikTok and you know getting sensory overload from a mobile phone is a really bad form of recovery. Watching TV is actually also really bad because you're having to process all of that as well, right? Best recovery is just fucking not doing anything. Man, my favorite thing, maybe because I'm old. I don't know how old you guys are. My favorite fucking thing to do is I just sit down and close my eyes for a while. It's fucking great, bro. My TV stopped working the other week. I'm not replacing it. It's so good. The, the audio works, the video doesn't. So now me and my girlfriend just listen to TV. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, but to drill down a little bit more and chunk down, like I said, um, when it comes to time management, is there anything in particular that you guys really want to address? Cool. Great. So here's an optimization thing you can do. It's called like um, automate, delegate, eliminate. So automate is, can we just get software to do this? Delegate is, can I just fucking get someone else to do this? And, and eliminate is, let's just not fucking do this. The fact of the matter is, if you guys have shit you want to do with your lives, you're just going to have to say no to a lot of other things. Because you get a bunch of, you, get, you guys are social people and you work in nightlife. All the requests you get to hang out with people and do this and kind of pick your brain, blah, blah, blah. You just got to start saying no to a lot of shit. A lot of it. My friends know this, and luckily I'm good enough friends with my friends that I can do this. Sometimes they'll invite me to their birthday, and as a joke, I, I, I'll see them eventually. I'll say, hey man, sorry I can't come. I don't want to go. <laughs> you just got to start saying no to stuff and being real picky with your time. It's just the harsh reality of these things. So automate, delegate, eliminate. Automate's more of a business thing because you can build like software. You wanted to talk about automation, we can talk about that in a bit. Delegate. Also, honestly, more of a business thing. It's just like, can I just fucking get someone else to do this? And eliminate is just like, let's just start deleting shit. And so when you guys start seeing stuff in your calendar, when you actually are out of white space, now you're deleting shit. Yeah, um, two points I want to make on that as well was um, you just can't expect extraordinary outputs with ordinary inputs. It's just a logic failure. You, just, you guys are just going to have to do stuff that other people aren't doing, and that just means saying no to a lot of shit. Other thing as well, a little bit more tactical. Um, 
You guys probably know about the screen time hack on iPhone. I've got a better app for you because if you just set your screen time to two hours and you're working, you can still access it for up to two hours. So there's an app called Opal, O-P-A-L. I think it's paid. Um, but what you can do is you can set blocks for like, okay, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., I'm not allowed to open this. Or maybe if I wait five seconds, I can take a break. Or you can set the difficulty mode as well, where like the last Friday of every month, like I have it coming up this week, I actually go to the library and work by myself, just in planning out the next month for the business. I make it fucking impossible to contact me. I can't even open any other apps, and I have to literally delete Opal from my phone. From like 9 a.m. to midday, it just blocks everything. It's fucking impossible to contact me. Even with like communication, things like that, I have WhatsApp just so I can talk to my girlfriend. She's the only other contact I have on there. <laughs> Right? I have notifications off on like Instagram and Messenger and things like that. I'll check them when I need them. If something's really important, someone's got my phone number. That's a really good idea, actually. I did that recently. It's absolute game changer. Yeah. I've got no notifications on until like 5 p.m. Then they all come down. Otherwise, yep. otherwise, you intermediately just check like every 30 minutes. Like, did I get a notification? Yeah, yeah. Because if your notifications are like off, you, like, you might get the notice. Like, Maybe I did get one and it didn't tell me, but I'll just use Opal. And like, I can't even fucking open it now. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, is there any changes it for myself? Yep. I got an Apple Watch, mm. so my phone is not even in my office anymore. Because mm. what I was finding is I'd complete a task and they'd be like, oh yeah, I'll pop on Instagram. And then all of a sudden yeah. it was like 15 minutes for gone or half an hour. Which is yeah. like, where did that time go? I got to the bathroom on my phone. And then yeah. that toilet trip goes from two minutes to all of a sudden 10, 15 minutes. 100%. Yeah. So yeah, the watch has been great. It's been a life changer for myself. Um, How do you negotiate? between promotion and creativity. So like just micro looking at your work time, getting that balance right. Because I, I tend to find I'm either doing too much of one or too much of the other. Yep, okay. Getting that. Is this something you have to deal with with our students? Sorry? Do um, we, um, yeah. yeah, the students, yeah. So I would do batch work on specific days. So let's say you got three days a week is on creativity and the other three are on, you know, whatever marketing, promoting kind of stuff. I wouldn't try and do it on the same day because I find when I'm trying to deviate between like two different sides of my brain of being logical then creative, I just get burnt out. Yeah. So for example, when I'm coaching clients, I have clients that either I'm helping them with their production and optimizing that stuff for them or it's building their brands with them. So I, I purposely don't have that on the same day because otherwise I just get burnt out trying to go in between both things. So if you can find a way to compact it, compartmentalize all of it in one day for just one particular thing, you'll find you'll have like way more energy. Yeah, that's really smart. Yeah, so batching us around. Did anyone else have any questions? I think there was one that I cut off about sleep or something like that. Oh, sleep, I've got a better question though. Um, uh, for the logical versus like creative mind, if your time boxing on like days, what like, I only have like three days Um, well, the management stuff, there's always going to be little bits and pieces that come up every now and then. I try to box that in after I'm already really tired because that stuff doesn't require like maximum effort. Like just checking notifications or emails and all that stuff, like you're not going to be requiring maximum energy for that. So I save that at the end of the day. But the hardest stuff I do first. So if you have, you know, let's say you get home from work, do the hardest stuff first because that's the amount of energy that you're obviously going to have with. Or if you've got, I'm assuming, do you have like a part time job? So there's some days. Okay, so you're, you've got all the time in the world basically to deviate when you want to do things. Yeah, so I would structure it as um, be, do, do as much creative work as you can when you feel like being creative because you can't really force that off a lot of the times. But also when you're not feeling that creative, use the technical side, logical side to optimize the creativity. So in terms of you know, your uh, template, your workflow, sample selection, all that, trying to make all different things you can do to speed up the workflow, because so then when you do feel creative, you're making the most out of the time. Um, in terms of, what was the other thing you were asking about besides the creativity? Um, I was more just like knowing what time boxing the creative tasks as well as the rational tasks, and uh, you said to do it all in one day. Like, yeah, the creatives, yeah, I mean, in between those two separate things, definitely separate the days up rather than have it all in the same day. It's just a, it's a clusterfuck, I wouldn't bother. And how yeah. many hours would you say, like, have, they're getting into flow state, would you stop after you leave the flow state, or would you do a reset to try and get back in the flow state? Yeah, so... Box that for like four hours, right? I'll stop <coughs> resetting, I've, I've, I've tried. Max flow you can do is usually about like, um, 
like 90 minutes. I like, I mean, you could do a Pomodoro timer, which is useful as well, um, but the 90 minutes is probably your tops, and then you'll have to have like a 15 minute break. Um, anything beyond that for a beginner, you're probably gonna struggle. Um, so just accept the 90 minute thing, take a break, try it again. Um, and then honestly, it just comes down to like a lot of practice. It's just like anything. It's just like doing more repetitions and like slipping into it. Um, yeah. There's uh, three uh, kind of points of the day, ultradarian cycles, where you can actually enter that focus a lot easier. So it's really about trial and error, trying to figure out when you actually feel most productive. You'll start to notice if, if you, you know, for you, you've got all the time in the world and you're able to, you know, be present in work any day, have a go at seeing when you feel most productive throughout that and then track that on your calendar, like make like an actual like block being like, oh, th these like this hour to this hour was when I was like super crazy productive and I've zoned in, right? So just keep notes of that and you'll start to realize there's a recurring pattern of when you're most productive. Mm. Like, like for example, some people, yeah, for some people yeah. it's like really late at night, you know, it's maybe it's 2 a.m. they get super creative. And then some people, for me, it's when um, from like 10 a.m. to 12, I'm like super productive. But unfortunately, I have to do boring sales calls then, so I'm not really using that time. But that's when I feel most productive, yeah. Switch. Well, I can't, I can't really choose when they can happen, you know, so. Yeah, the, yeah. Other, the other thing as well is just like, you just got to accept reality and deal with yeah. it. Like if you just got obligations. Yeah, like if you've got a <laughs> like, yeah. You can't really tell your manager, yeah. hey bro, I've got a flow block scheduled right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like if you've got a nine to five, obviously you can't work around that. You know, you can't be like, like you said, you can't just stop mid work and like, excuse me, I've got to do a second work. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, any other questions um, either related to this or anything else that I was talking about? Sure. Like your <laughs> <laughs> you fucking look at me like that. Because um, I'm looking around the room and I'm like, oh yeah, this is like the DJ world. So I'm like, I'm like, people are struggling with time. It's like, well, maybe you don't get months. It's like the night. Yeah, before. yeah, that was a big thing for me as well. Um, the answer is gradually and still not completely. Um, yeah, honestly, like you guys, the writing's on the wall. You guys are set up for failure in a pretty bad environment if you want to like not drink and sleep well and eat well and it's just the environment right like I got healthy when I stopped working in nightclubs otherwise all the odds are kind of against you um, <clears throat> I don't have a good answer um, un unfortunately it's just about pre like you can't go from like I don't know whatever the fuck I was doing in 2017 to you know what I'm doing now overnight it's literally just gradual um, exercise is the first thing. I, I'll, I'll make this point, this is really important. I do notice an absolutely direct correlation between how often I physically train and just how good I'm feeling and how productive I'm feeling. Like the last three weeks I wasn't training because I had like a fight and I, had, I was in Melbourne and all this, or Sydney, wherever the fuck I was, um, and couldn't train and then had awful time at work. Um, there's a pretty direct correlation there. Um, which is like physical training as well. And it doesn't need to be a whole lot. Like when I first started, I'll just go for a walk for 15 minutes. You know, I'd train like fucking 17 times a week or something like that. <laughs> Takes up a lot of blank space in the calendar. Um, I'll give you some other tactical stuff. Um, get an anti, do you drink a lot? You can be real with me. Nah, I used to. I mean, I was also asking for the room because like full-time DJ, I'm like, well, if you're struggling for time, maybe like plan ahead and be like, okay, tonight I'm not going to drink because tomorrow I'm going to commit to drink. <coughs> The other thing for that is get like, I don't think they sponsor me anymore, so it doesn't matter. Like you can actually get like anti-hangover products and they're fucking legit. Um, I was sponsored by one for a while, um, but like they're legit. Like I could drink a lot, like not a small amount of alcohol. Drink this fucking little sachet thing, tastes like garbage. Wake up, this thing was the fountain of youth, honestly. Um, people would always argue, they're like, oh, it's so expensive. I'm like, bro, you spent like more on a vodka Red Bull last night. Just drink the fucking thing, right? Alkavit. There's a couple other ones. Drink, but does that make it better? Like, yeah, monumentally like better. Like, you, I'll, I could literally drink like 40 standard drinks, drink this Alkavit thing, wake up feeling like it's Tuesday afternoon. I'm not lying. <laughs> <laughs> so we just encourage everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I tested it. Like, this thing's fucking legit. <laughs> What's that? Is that yeah, it's actually really, really healthy. I was drinking it when I wasn't drinking. There was just that many vitamins in it. Um, anyway, aside from that, does anyone else have any questions? Or?
difficult things, they work great. But if you are, you know, have mm -hmm. a great attention span, if you're in the ADD world, the yeah. ADHD world, yeah. um, I don't know if anybody here is, but I can say from my being a music manager full time, mm -hmm. um, I can have as many times as I want. If I don't have them in front of mind, they won't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right next to my uh, desk and just planning two weeks out on that yep. because then it's right there. It's not on an app. Yep. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I can add to that because I'm ADD as fuck and yeah. even with taking Dexies, I'm still bad in the sense that I need to have short-term goals, long-term goals that I review like throughout the day constantly and on a month-by-month -month and a yearly basis. So I've got... At the every start of every year, I'll have all the goals that I want to do in the entire year. So even if they're like really ridiculous, impossible ones, like, I don't know, going to the moon, not that ridiculous, obviously, but just like far out there kind of shit. And then the small ones as well. And then what I'll do is I'll plot out on a month by month basis of what I want to do per month, splitting those things up. And so as I start the month, I'm like, I'm going to do all these things in that month. And then as I'm going through each week, I can remind myself of like, you know, saying done next to each thing to remind myself this is how far I've come and this is how little I've done at the same time. And that's really going to motivate you because you can look back in introspective and be like, either you've done fuck all or you've done heaps. You know? And if you've done heaps, getting reminders as you scroll down from January all the way down to where we are now, October, I get to see all the things I've done and be like, God damn, I'm going to keep building on that. And you're going to get more motivated and more of that dopamine just by seeing that. So that really helps. Um, I'm not... The calendar stuff doesn't really work for me because it only works for me in the sense that if there's like an appointment that someone's got with me, then like I have to do it. It's like, okay, that's not in my control. I have to do it. But when it's things that are in my control, I tend to like deviate around it. So I'm in the same boat as you. But that's why the goal stuff helps more, more so because, you know, even I've got like a pen and paper for the things that I need to do right now and I'll cross it off. But even sometimes that doesn't work. And so the, the short-term, long-term goals in that sense really changed it for me. So I use... Uh, this note-taking app called Obsidian. And so it's like a second brain. So you can, you can write out every single, thing, every single thing that's in your brain in like folders, basically. So I've got like relationship stuff, um, finance stuff, I've got industry set stuff, I've got um, music stuff, like everything is segmented. And then you can have little notes within each folder. And then what you can do as well is you can hyperlink everything together mm. and it will show you a visual representation of like your brain, how that's all interlinked, which is quite interesting. Yeah. But Has anyone used Obsidian? Fucking sick. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> if you want to yeah, dump like half your brain, all the things, ruminating thoughts you always yeah. have about things, it's you can free, just put it so all yeah. there. And free you can up link a lot all of the energy. notes together and it looks like a fucking network. It's sick. It's really, it's really satisfying because you can... Oh, it's cool. Um, Has anybody used Notion? Oh, yeah. No, Notion's, Notion's good as well, but I find yeah. um, Obsidian's good just because it's like blank. So you yeah. don't really need to like intertwine things and whatever. Yeah. But Notion's great. Yeah, yeah Notion's it. great as well. I think we're going to build something on it. But um, cool. Does anyone else have any questions or queries, either related to time or just anything I talked about? Cool. Should we take a break? Yeah. Cool. Sure. Jackson kindly got cups and there's a water cooler in there. So if anyone's particularly parched, there's a water cooler.